All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the second public hearing that we're having on the proposed zoning amendments. Uh, we've, we've broken it down essentially between those amendments, the ones last night, which require a two thirds majority vote and those amendments tonight, which requ uh, require a, uh, only a simple majority uh, to approve. And that's because the state of Massachusetts has considered them sufficiently important to change what was the longstanding rule for passage of zoning amendments. So I'm gonna just go through public notice as quickly as I can. And then I'm gonna turn things over to Chris um, Kushel and Ralph uh, from MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Council to do kind of a, a succinct PowerPoint, just going over what the amendments are uh, tonight that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, I really would prefer not talking about anything that was discussed last night tonight, because tonight we've got plenty to talk about. And um, after I read through the public notice, I'll say a little more about that. Okay, 6.30 p.m., January 27, 2022. This public hearing will concern, will concern three new zoning bylaws, which as required by state law, will only, will only require a simple majority vote at town meeting. These are a substantial modification to the existing accessory dwelling unit, ADU provisions, a replacement of the open space residential development, OSRD bylaw and a new transit oriented transit oriented village overlay district TOVOD bylaw. So unlike last night, these are essentially new. Um, ADUs, uh, section 5B. The, the proposed ADU bylaw allows ADUs as a right in all zoning districts and eliminates the requirement that an ADU must have a lot area sufficient for two dwelling units. It also excludes ADUs from the area and dimensional requirements of other accessory buildings. Section 6C2 allows for an ADU to be created within an existing occupied residence. Section 5C3 through 6 establishes ADU rules, including enforcement penalties and, very important, prohibitions on short-term rentals. Okay, that's the ADU portion of this. OSRD, which is the Open Space Residential Development. This new section 11 simplifies and encourages the use of OSRDs in the lieu of conventional subdivision development. An OSRD promotes clustering of homes and preservation of open space within a development. This section an OSRD can be done as of right and has no minimum lot size while a conventional subdivision requires a special permit. TOVOD, the new, the new section 12. TOVOD is an overlay district in the existing residential zoning district on properties near the MBTA station. It has been created in part to bring the town in compliance with the housing choice zoning reforms created by new section 3A of 40A of the Massachusetts general laws applicable to MBTA communities of which Rockport is one. We are on the MBTA line. We are by definition an MBTA community. The TOVOD is a multifamily, multi-use overlay district of approximately 13 acres. With an overlay district, the existing zoning would remain, but the TOVOD allows for development of a higher density multi-use project, which would be subject to the design guidelines incorporated into the TOVOD bylaw. The objective of the TOVOD bylaw is to allow for more affordable housing in the town mixed with commercial uses. Uh, all of these, the, the ADUs, the, um, access, the uh, TOVOD and the OSRD are types of zoning that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has said are very important to provide uh, a diversity and affordable housing in communities. And that's why they've reduced the approval level from two thirds at town meeting 
down to a simple majority. And we'll get in, uh, and um, Chris Kusher will talk a little more about that in his presentation. At the public hearing, all interested persons shall be given an opportunity to be heard, and the rules for the conduct of planning board hearings can be found on the board's webpage. Just one brief thing about those rules. I don't know how many people have actually bothered to read them, but in addition to coming to the meeting tonight, those rules allow for written comments to be submitted to the board. However, those rules say that written comments should be submitted at least two days before the public hearing so we can have the benefit of those comments at the public hearing. However, I'm just assuming that a lot of people don't read those rules. So if anybody has any written comments they want to submit, uh, do it within the next, within seven days of today's meeting, because we have our next regular planning board meeting next Thursday, and we really need to have any written comments before that meeting, okay? Uh, and then the, the texts of these amendments were available at the town clerk's office and also at the planning board office for anybody to review, and they were also posted on the town's webpage. So everybody has had the opportunity to take a look at these um, if they wanted to uh, on their own to formulate their questions. At this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Chris Kuschel, who's who's done, um, you know, with working with the planning board, done a PowerPoint presentation just to kind of give you a little more detail about what these three separate uh, relatively new provisions uh, include. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. I'm sharing my screen now. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see a lot of the same folks as well as some, some new ones as well. Um, okay, as directed, I am going to be succinct. Um, however, there, I do want to also provide a little bit of extra context um, to, to these bylaws tonight because um, they're, they're pretty important and there's a lot to them. So last night we discussed a lot of things. Tonight we're only discussing a few things, but they're, they're fairly weighty. So they're, um, as, as Jason earlier said, accessory dwelling units, open space residential development, and a transit-oriented village overlay district. So starting with some of the context, well, why is the planning board considering these changes? Um, several reasons. First, the town itself has developed um, uh, goal, community goals around the housing needs within town. Um, and that includes increasing the options and types of housing that tend to be attractive for, um, especially for younger adults, often without kids, as well as people who are empty nesters or retirees who are maybe looking to downsize from, from their single family home. And what that does then is it helps free up some of your single family homes that already exist to help welcome more families within your town. And then finally, as Jason said, there's this new legislation that's out and these bylaws are intended to help comply with some of those requirements. So I wanna kind of now unpack that just a little bit. Uh, in terms of kind of the community goals, several years ago, I mentioned this last night, there was a, a visioning process community-wide that was done that really was intended to help set um, priorities for the town. Um, I, I, you probably can't read um, some, of the, um, some of these on the chart here, but the number one top priority that came through was increasing affordable housing. Um, and when I say affordable housing, my understanding from this um, survey that was done was they don't just mean deed restricted affordable housing, sometimes we say capital A, but all types of housing that is more affordable, even, at, even if it's market rate housing. On the other hand, that's actually not what's happening. Um, and this chart um, shows the median home prices within the town of Rockport over the past decade, prices have shot up 80% from where they were. Um, that, that far exceeds inflation, far exceeds um, people's wages. Clearly, this is a problem, um, not only in Rockport, other communities have seen um, house prices um, go through the roof as well. But the upshot is that Rockport is becoming less affordable to many of the people who used to be able to afford um, to live in Rockport, um, to becoming less diverse. Um, and it's, it's just not um, providing the opportunities for many people. 
And sort of coupled with that are a number of um, challenges that, that Rockport's facing. There was a previous study that the town worked with, I believe it was the Donahue Institute um, that did some um, demographic projections. And what they found was that Rockport's projected growth is actually the loss, I should say, is um, among the highest in the state. Um, it's projected to fall um, quite precipitously. And when you look at the makeup of the, the resulting demographics, um, I think two things sort of stand out. One is that the percentage of school-age children is, is falling, and the percentage of, um, of people who are 70 plus is drastically growing. So there are a number of challenges associated with that. Um, then also thrown into this mix is over the past year, um, legislation was passed called Housing Choice, and the intent, as Jason said, was to help um, facilitate the production of more housing to help address the housing crisis that we face within our state and in particular the Boston, metro Boston region. So some of the votes, such as the ones we're discussing tonight, it allows for a simple majority rather than the supermajority. They also have requirements, and one of them is to have a multifamily district around the station. And so I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so now we'll transition to the first. So that's the context. We'll now talk about the first bylaw, which is the accessory dwelling units bylaw. So this is called ADUs. They are also known sometimes as in-law apartments or granny flats, and they're an important type of housing. Um, and the reasons for that, they're, they're small, so they uh, often allow people to downsize, to live near their family or to remain in their community. By nature of the fact that they're smaller, they are more naturally affordable than a single family home would be, and they have small development impacts. It's just on an existing lot. You already allow ADU, so this isn't a brand new bylaw, but there are a number of issues with the existing bylaw. For one thing, um, and I think probably which what we heard loud and clear is really one of the top concerns is that they can be used for short-term rentals, meaning things like Airbnb, that there's no restrictions. So we, we wanted to address that. They also don't have any standards really that ensure that the ADU actually fits within the character of, of the lot or of the community in general. But then on the other hand, they have a number of provisions that actually make the bylaw essentially unusable um, in most situations, especially in the situations where you probably would most want to have an ADU. So we wanted to kind of take a look and address all of those. Just a little bit here about the types of ADUs, what we mean. Um, they can be different ways. They could be a standalone structure, it could be a carriage house. It could be built on top of a garage or it could be a garage itself that has been converted. It could be a basement. The photos on the bottom show a few examples of ADUs. Let me interrupt you for one second, just to clarify. These examples, which are good, are they examples that apply to what's in the ADU law now or what would be if the new ADU law was approved? Sure. So a best practice is to allow for all of these. Today, um, the only type of ADU that is allowed is as a standalone unit. So in other words, the current ADU bylaw that's on the books now in the town, there's only one of these four that is permitted. Correct. And it's arguably the one that has the biggest development impact because it actually requires construction of a, of a, new, um, a new, a separate building. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the proposed modifications, there's several of them um, that I think are worth highlighting. One is to allow the ADUs um, by right in all residential districts. At the same time, adding a number of requirements that I think are, are fairly critical. Um, most significantly are the ones that expressly prohibit short-term rentals. Um, it requires an owner to attest in writing that short-term rentals will not occur, um, that also they are not allowed to um, advertise for them on the um, platforms that, that um, such as airbnb.com, and that there are, um, the, the town is empowered with, to have civil financial penalties um, and potentially uh, um, terminate the certificate of occupancy for violations of this. 
Um, to, to Jason's earlier question, it now clarifies and allows ADUs to be both detached or as part of the main building. There was also a question last night, um, and I think what, the, what the, um, the question was hinting at was, well, could somebody just essentially build a two-family home and just call one of them um, an accessory dwelling unit? And the answer is no, because there are, among other um, requirements, a, a limit to the size. So it can only be a maximum of 900 square feet. So they're, they're fairly small. Um, and then finally, there are a number of design criteria to, to ensure that, um, that it fits with the principal structure. And, and one other thing, just to remind everybody, if this law is approved, it only applies prospectively. It doesn't apply to existing uh, Airbnbs, to existing rentals, to existing ADUs that may not comply with this law. We This law is a zoning law. It only applies going forward to people or homeowners who want to have an ADU on their property. Go ahead, Chris, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, second one is what, I, what we're calling it, what is called an open space residential development, an OSRD. The purpose of an OSRD is to help protect open space when the development occurs for residences, for specifically for single family residences. And it, it um, requires a percentage of the land to actually be preserved as open space. Um, by having homes sited on smaller lots, and that allows for that preservation of the open space. And another benefit is it reduces the impervious surfaces because you have less roadway that needs to be constructed because the homes are sited a little bit closer together. Um, I have a diagram that I think will help make that a little bit clearer. So this is, imagine a tract of land that an owner has, um, and they subdivided their land. This is a traditional, sort of what traditionally happens. They create a couple of cul-de-sacs um, and the entire plot of land is then divided and sold. Um, there, there's no open space that is actually preserved or um, accessible. If you take that same tract of land here, an OSRD still has the same number of homes and they can be the same size homes. I don't think that necessarily comes through on this um, diagram, but the same number of homes but the lots, because they're smaller and the homes can then be clustered a little bit closer together, that allows a high percentage of that tract to actually be pre preserved in perpetuity as open space. So I think it has a major benefit to the town. So a couple of the provisions. So I, I think Jason mentioned this, but just to clarify, you do have an OSRD on the books today. Um, it, it's quite dense. It's actually quite cumbersome. Um, and it, it essentially doesn't work, uh, sort of like the ADU. It, I don't know if it's ever been taken advantage of within the town. And so this is intended to rectify that by providing an alternative that is more compatible with what we consider um, best practices and, and makes sense for the town of Rockport. Um, so a couple of the key points. One is that the OSRD, rather than being through a special permit and being through this cumbersome process, this is the default. This is what's as of right. Um, if a landowner has a good reason for wanting to do something different that's not, that doesn't comply with the provisions of the OSRD, they can do that, but then it's through a special permits. Um, so the onus is on them to show why that would be less impactful um, and detrimental to the town. 60% of the land of the tract must be devoted to open space. Um, the ownership of that can be done in a number of ways, all of which is clearly outlined in the proposed bylaw. And just in general, the process for determining how many homes can be built um, and how and the process for um, moving forward is much more, I think, simplified from what was previously um, or what is currently on your books. Okay, so that's the OSRD. And now I'll transition to, to the final one. Jason, did you wanna say anything else on the OSRD? No, that's, that's all, thank you, Chris. Okay, so the final one is, this is a new district now. This is, it's called, the Transit Oriented Village Overlay District, um, TOVOD, or maybe I'll just say TOV because it's a little bit simpler right here. Um, several years ago, the town worked um, with MEPC on a, a public uh, on a public process that was intended to 
helps set forth a vision for the area around the train station um, and included a number of um, fairly detailed recommendations most um, significantly zoning recommendations, but also considerations about transportation and, and other aspects. Uh, in this process, we it included meetings with landowners. There were a couple public forums, um, as well as a number of planning board meetings, both for that visioning process. And then to essentially help implement that vision partially is to create zoning that is compatible with that vision. And that's what this overlay district um, is intended to do. It also has the benefit now that we have this new legislation to actually meet those requirements um, and, and actually um, so that the, the town is in compliance with the, with the state law. So some of the key features of this overlay district. Um, so for one thing, just to clarify, when I say overlay district, what that means is it's a, it's a zoning district that essentially sits on top of the existing base zoning districts in that area. So that in a landowner has the choice. So they don't lose any existing rights. They can still develop under the existing zoning, but they now have an alternative um, if, if they prefer this um, TOV zoning. Some of the key characteristics of it are it allows for mixed use development around the station. Um, the station areas are generally where we like to see um, these walkable mixed use neighborhoods. Um, a, a number of these people who live here would likely take the train to work. Um, they also live in an area where they can easily walk to the downtown or just walk to get a you know, bite to eat or go to the dry cleaners because all of that is part of this mixed use district. It allows for a diversity of housing choices and types, including townhomes, as well as the mixed use. Uh, when I say mixed use, um, which I, I talked about last night, but what we mean is the ground floor would have commercial space. Um, so you might think of sort of the window shopping, cafes or, or stores, and then residences on top of that, um, as well as multifamily buildings. Um, as I noted, all of the existing uses remain because of you still have your base zoning district. It includes um, a, a number of design standards that are intended to ensure that development has the characteristics um, that are compatible with, with a town like Rockport. Um, one of the things I remember when we were going through the, the visioning process, there were concerns that people heard mixed use or transit oriented and that they were um, rightfully concerned that this is gonna turn into something like Rantoul Street in Beverly. And um, so the, the regulations very clearly ensure that the scale is something that is a much more appropriate to a, a town like Rockport than to um, a, a city. Um, and then finally, I just wanna note also that this type of development is actually really good for the environment because when you're concentrating development in a smaller area, um, it actually uh, it helps preserve um, existing open space. It's um, sited in a location that is, helps protect your watersheds and your water supply. As part of the process, we had put together a number of diagrams. Um, one thing that I think tends to trip people up is that zoning is not a development proposal. Um, any landowner, whether it's under the proposed zoning or the existing zoning, they would still go through the normal process of um, putting in their application, going through site plan review and any other requirements, whether it's a special permit um, or not. Zoning is essentially the framework that allows for development to occur um, and provides the rules that, for that to occur. This area today can be developed today, but it can be developed in a way that really would not meet the, um, the needs of, of the town as, as defined through that process that um, the town went through a couple of years ago. So these diagrams are just intended to help give a sense of the scale, the just very, very high level general character of what development could look like. Things like you're still looking at two and a half story maximum buildings. Um, there are a number of design requirements for the buildings to, to ensure that they are um, essentially sort of traditional style buildings. Um, 
things like traditional roof lines. There are requirements for open space. The parking requirements that we talked about last night would apply for, for this, as well as the um, housing balance, meaning your inclusionary zoning, affordable housing requirements, all is still applicable under this overlay district. Yeah, Chris, I should just mention that, and most people don't know this, that the area of Whistle Stop Mall and the uh, Smiths uh, hardware, all, the, all around the train station there, it is not zoned commercial. It is zoned for residential. There's not one house anywhere near that mall, in that mall. This is a residential zone, yet the way this has been developed is commercial. So it has nothing to do with the underlying zoning. Yeah, and that's a good point. And so that, that would mean that they, the hardware store, for example, is, is not in compliance today, um, which could pose a problem if they wanted to do something, um, whereas the, that type of use is part of the TOBOD. Um, and here is just a final, it's just a map of that area. Um, it, it's fairly small. It, it comes to, a, I think it's about a little bit under 12 acres um, of, around the, the train station. Okay, so that was my succinct overview of those three bylaws. I'll stop sharing for now and I'll hand it back to you, Jason. Okay, uh, we're gonna open it up for public comment. Just a couple of housekeeping things. We're, um, the, the rules for public hearings uh, say that your public comment should be limited to three minutes. I understand there's a lot here and three minutes would be um, too short for many people to issue their public comments. So we're gonna allow some flexibility on that. At the same time, we can't, it's unfair to the other participants, um, one person to comment on going on for 15, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, if you've got a lot of comments, as I said before, we're, we're certainly open and encourage uh, written submissions uh, of, of those comments, which we would like to get obviously as soon as possible. But if you've got a lot to say, the best thing is to do it in writing. I guarantee you we will read it and consider it. So that being said, um, why don't we, uh, Kelsey, open it up to people to comment. They have to raise their hand, state your name, state your address, and um, tell us what you have to say about any of this, if you have any questions. Okay, so first up is Christine Downing. Christine, you're unmuted. Thanks. I just want, I'll write something because it's um, easier and clearer, but I wanted, I, I know that, that um, sound in that area is a, is a significant problem and i hope that you address buffers um christine hi could you tell us where you live yeah oh i beg your pardon christine downing um uh 19 parker street okay thank you yeah um Anyway, sound buffers, and I, and I hope that you'll address that because you can stand in Ace Hardware and vibrate. It's really uh, an, at an unhealthy level, I believe, and it affects all of the senior housing as well. What did you uh, say? So, what did you say about vibrating? I didn't hear you. Um, it the uh, trains, the okay. noise, from the train, the, the impact of the sound is really significant. It's not small. Um, so I hope that you'll address that with buffers. Um, it needs to be, it would be, um, how can I say it, civilized to uh, do that also for the senior housing that's across that creek. Um, uh, and I wanted to make, uh, just reinforce a couple of things that when you, when you add um, um, denser housing, you increase uh, not only parking, but traffic issues. And that, that gets clogged, that uh, intersection at five corners gets clogged. And, certainly in the um, summertime, but on weekends regularly. So I'll write the rest of it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Next. Next up, I have Nancy. Nancy, you've been requested to unmute. Okay. 
Hi, this is Nancy Duda, and I'm here with my husband, Bob. We're at 21 Smith Road, and Bob has a few questions this evening. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yep. So I have uh, I have eight, eight comments, I think, that can help Chris tighten up the document, and I have one editorial point. Um, so these are specific to the ADU comments, and under part one, under the intent, Chris, there's the term um, clearly subordinate, that the, uh, the ADU is clearly subordinate to the primary dwelling. It's just not a very, it's not a very objective term. And I apologize that I don't, I don't have a better suggestion to offer you, but it's, it's just a very subjective term. Okay, we'll time that. My second comment is uh, under the section for rules for the ADUs, um, part B, you say no more than one accessory apartment we're up above, you define the ADUs as being either an apartment or a detached accessory building. I think you may be better served by saying no more than one ADU per lot, because I think it'd be encompassing. Okay. Um, uh, C, under the rules for the ADU, this one probably deserves a little bit of dialogue here. Um, it says the owner must occupy uh, the principal dwelling of the ADU. You may want to define what, it, what occupy means. And I'm not being a wise guy. Um, there's a very common use case in this town of Rockport where people have multiple homes and they live here seasonally. So I could certainly envision a use case where somebody would come here for the summer, occupy their primary dwelling, um, rent out the, the ADU long term. And it could be a terrific, terrific benefit to have somebody staying in the, the ADU um, for the entire time to watch the property. And if you accept that, you can flip this on its head and you could say that, well, the primary dwelling could be rented out full time and the primary owner could come in and use the, the ADU as their seasonal home. So uh, Chairman Shar, I don't know if you've thought about that angle at all. I, your question is interesting because how, how if someone's occupying an ADU, I mean, occupying the principal dwelling for less than absolutely full time, how would you possibly enforce that? I, I don't know, but I mean, you know, a person's got to have the limits to go away on a vacation, to be sick and, you know, go to a hospital. I mean, they're certainly yeah, they're not going to be there hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Well, of course. Well, what if they're there for six months out of the year? Is that enough? I, I would say, I, I, I think, yeah, that's a question, but I, I would say that it would be, I mean, yeah, they, they see, are I, occupying I, it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I take your comment to heart, but I, I don't know whether it's something we can, can get into defining without getting into a very long definition. But go ahead, keep on going. Okay, I, I think that's one that should be considered because it is such a common use case in this town. Um, uh, under part four for the rules for the internal ADUs, uh, uh, section A, it's a, this is a, a really picky comment where it says 250 to 900 square feet max or 33% of the total habitable space of the principal dwelling. 250 to 900 square feet of what? I think what you mean is 250 to 900 square feet of habitable space. And again, this sort of gets back to the comment that I made last night. There's a lot of homes that are one and a half stories and you could create an ADU with, with lots of eaves in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And, and likewise, that same comment would apply to section 5A as well, where it's 250 to 900 square feet uh, of 40%. Of and again, I think it's of habitable space. Yeah. And then finally, uh, or, or along that line as well, is what if the principal dwelling is a two family home, then what exactly would the 33% or the 40% be based on? Would it be based on the owner's occupied unit? I don't think it should be based on the combined size of both units. And I would argue that it, it should be the smaller of the two. You're saying if it's a two-family home with an ADU. With an ADU, yeah. Yeah, okay, yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then um, under part C, uh, I think this is a really important, this is a really important one where, where the detached ADU meets the setbacks of the principal dwelling. And I, I think that's like a critically important uh, and almost non-negotiable minimal uh, minimum requirement that's there. And, and you use the term as well as other dimensional controls. I would I would urge you to be even more specific and state that you know that the ADU meets the the uh, it satisfies satisfies the requirements of the schedule of area and dimensions, because I think it needs to satisfy 
frontage, uh, lot size, building coverage, height, uh, number of stories, um, uh, all of those. Okay. Um, and, and, with, and with regards to the quality that's being constructed, especially for a detached ADU, I'm assuming that, that this is going to be built the same way like a small house would be built, that Paul's going to go in and inspect it, you know, as it's rough plumbed, rough wired, uh, before the insulation goes in, all of those same, those same guidelines for a home are going to apply. Is that correct? It's a build, they're going to have to get a building permit. Okay. Is, are you going to require that there is separate power and separate water metering to these ADUs? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, I mean, it's something to consider. Okay. And then, and then in, in the document, you go to great pains. Are you about to wrap it up because- Yes, I am. Okay. You go to great pains to, uh, to keep the architectural integrity of the primary dwelling when it's, a, when it's an internal eight in apartment, but you're silent on that, completely silent on that for the detached ADU. And uh, I'm not suggesting that the, uh, that the detached ADU needs to be a mini me of the primary house, but I, I think there should be some language in there that it's either sympathetic or complementary to that house in some way. Okay, good comments. Thank you. Okay. All right, anybody uh, next person? Next, I have Jamie Buchanan. You're unmuted. Thank you. Um, and I'm actually Jamie Medea. Um, miraculously, I got married. Buchanan's my middle name. Um, I am at Holbrook Court, um, which intersects with King Street, uh, just a little outside the new district. Um, first, thank you all very much for your service, the volunteer service. It is indeed thankless. Um, so I'm thanking you, just to prove the point. Um, I'm going to send you written comments because I think that's more useful for you than in a, a setting like this. Um, I teach land use law at Boston College Law School and I teach environmental law at Northeastern Law School. So I'm going to be um, in the written comments really precise on some of the wording in hopes of being useful to you. Today, um, I'm just gonna say a few quick things. First, you thrilled me, truly thrilled me with your observations about the need to restrict accessory units um, to not become uh, essentially uh, Airbnbs all over Rockport. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That doesn't create more housing, um, especially the part about there being granny units or in-laws, they're not anymore unless there are restrictions on how often they can be rented. Um, I am likely to suggest um, in what I write that the, there be an on-site resident, not necessarily the on-site owner um, year round, because there are people who may wanna keep their home here um, and rent it year round. Um, and that still serves the purpose of having year round rental. Um, I also should add that I am a, I'm an example for you. Our home is technically two family already. And we use the entire upstairs apartment now, but if anything happens to me and I can't earn a living anymore, the rest of my family can rent that apartment and it pays the mortgage on the whole house. So um, we also have two back sheds that the lobstermen used to use for um, repairing their um, nets and such. And now, you know, we store stuff in it, we use it as a man cave, whatever. Um, but that might turn into an accessory. So I just wanted to share that I'm just outside your district and um, I and I think the majority of my neighbors fit into what you're talking about as what you want. So my you, second point- I want to address that, Chris, because maybe there's a misunderstanding. No, I don't think, um, I don't think I misunderstood anything. I think, um, I, think I, I, hear, I hear the comments and I think they're good comments. Just outside the ADU district. No, I meant outside your uh, village, the new uh, overlay village. Yeah. Well, the overlay. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were Yeah, they, they go together um, in a way that I'm about to connect. Um, uh, so just to be more clear, Mr. Chair, what I mean is in the, ex in the entire town, you've made excellent, um, excellent, uh, you've done excellent work in addressing those key issues of actually creating housing and not rental units um, for visitors um, sprinkled throughout town with no, no controls. 
second point I was going to make, though, is my entire neighborhood already has that type of housing. People are already doing everything they can to rent out an accessory unit. So mm. I'm very glad that you are grandfathering, so to speak, existing um, facilities, but pay attention um, to how you know, um, how one has documented their existing. Most people have had not had a process of recording that they are doing those accessory things already. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So I think, although I haven't finished reading the very dense documents, I'm hopeful that you'll uh, be attentive to that. I don't want to run out of time um, before I want to ask you a question. On the proposal for open space, um, I do have two questions um, with my points. The, the question for open space is, how many parcels are left, do you think, in Rockport that could conceivably um, be using this? Or will we talk, we'd be talking about assembly of parcels and teardowns? You're talking about the OSRD, I believe, Yes, right? sir, I am, yeah. yeah. Um, we didn't do, as part of the analysis, that um, to answer that question. So I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure if, if Jason or somebody if, else does. If nobody is sure, then I would suggest um, being attentive to discouraging total teardowns for the purpose of rebuilding. You know, people will, will be able to assemble large parcels mm -hmm. Um, individually, there are there are some large parcels, as far as Rockport goes, large parcels in the town, uh, especially in the you know away from the, the coastal areas. Um, if you look at the zoning map, you'll see a lot of green, the double A zoning district in the town of Rockport, which I don't have a survey of what what is available, but there are some. I know there are some larger parcels there in fact yeah okay i would also just note i mean this is still just an you're not getting anything different from your traditional subdivision um so if, if it's not happening now under the existing subdivision in terms of the teardowns i don't really see why that would happen anymore so um, here, here's doing... my my suggestion include if uh, include that special it's not as of right if a teardown is involved so you're discouraging the teardown of existing. Um, and the reason I suggest that is I live right across from the Linden Tree Inn, which is now, thank God, thanks to you all, it's been purchased and is being renovated from within. In, and the unit next to it, the carriage house, is remaining a single family home instead of what could have happened, which is a complete teardown of the entire beautiful structure and a creation of probably eight or nine separate units mm -hmm. under this open space residential district. So my suggestion is include something that um, yeah, requires that's a, I think special that's a good, permit. I think that's a good, a good suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then on, I know I'm going to run out of time. So on the um, TOVID, or I call it TOVID, it sounds like Torah, but overlay, <laughs> on the overlay. Um, I, I would have extended it, the zone itself, um, to include what's currently the multifamily housing area um, that is quite aged. Um, so that in the restoration of that area, it can be multi-use also. So it's just a, a personal thing for me, I would have extended it to include that area. Um, and the other, what was I gonna say? I hope you include provisions that in building um, new structures and uses there, that the same provisions, if possible, apply to encourage multifamily um, year round occupancy. Otherwise we would become even more a C, no pun intended or pun intended, okay, um, of people who use Rockport for second homes and visitation and not um, full-time living. Um, so thank you very much. I'll give comments in writing and I very much appreciate your service. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. um, next up I have Diane. Vela, Diane, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank everybody for doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. I am uh, at 17 King Street, down the street from the previous uh, speaker. Um, and I am delighted that this is happening. And I think that there can be some things that tighten it up a little bit more. And we may have a, sell, a sales job to do. Um, well, first question I have is all three of these will be three separate votes at town meeting, correct? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, we haven't formulated that yet. That's that's down the road when we when it goes on the warrant, how these are going to be handled. That's certainly a possibility. Okay. 
um, because I think what needs to be thought about is how is this going to be sold to the town? Uh, I think that there's, you will get some opposition. I have heard and seen opposition. And so I think that there, that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, I think no. your PowerPoint was terrific. Yeah, I'm sorry. We, we will do that. We will make it so, try to make it. I mean, I'm inclined to say that that's the way it should be, but you know, we have to talk with town council. We have right. to talk with the moderator. So, you know, that's all down the road, but I hear what you're saying. Okay. Um, you know, I am so in support of the overlay. I agree that it could be bigger. Um, I think that we uh, need to even consider, you know, uh, smaller units can be just fine. Um, we want families to come in. It can be affordable and perhaps even low income housing to get more families and more people in here that live here and work here or work and commute. Um, as far as the accessory dwelling unit, I think 30 days is a minimum. I really think you can make that bigger because a lot of people have 30 day vacations in the summertime. And if you're gonna, if you really want this to be more housing, I think you need to really extend that um, and even consider the separate utilities because that would be a way to know if there is somebody, people coming in and out of there. Um, uh, let's see, what else did I have? Um, I, I was concerned when you said that the Whistle Stop Mall and the Ace Hardware have not been in compliance with that zoned residential. How does that happen that that has been? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a fair, I've been here for 10 years, so I don't have the whole history of. Uh, yeah, neither do I. It, it, I don't know how it happened, but it happened. And somehow, well, I think it's important to know how it happened because well, that's what will happen again. Well, no, because it, I, I don't know what came first, the, <laughs> the construction or then someone decided to plunk down a residential zone there. But the, the point is that's the zoning right now is residential. It's zone residential. Yeah, and, often uses are, if they're already existing when the zoning's been changed, then they're grandfathered in. And that's what typically often happens. They become non-conforming, but they have a right to continue to be there. Yeah, no, I, I understand. But I also think that there's always um, a lot attorneys that go for precedent and go behind and dig up the old stuff. And then it can um, uh, undermine what it is that we're, try we're trying to do here. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate what you're doing. Keep it up, make it more, make, uh, you know, that this is the only way I believe we're going to save this town um, is to not make it an, an, a giant assisted living community because that's what it's turning into is the oldest by age community in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and our schools are, uh, you know, I want a multi-generational place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. One thing I just want to make a comment because I know some people have some people have said, well, we don't want Rock Park to change. We love it, et cetera. We we love its small charm and everything. Um, Rockport is changing if we do nothing. It is changing because the population is getting older and the housing prices are getting higher. That trend, unless something happens majorly. That trend will simply continue. So Rockport is changing right now. So this, this change hopefully will uh, put things in a, the right direction for having you know, more affordable housing and maybe having younger families and maybe even helping our school have students. So you know, these are all, obviously it's all speculative at this point, but you gotta start somewhere. Anyway, that's all I have to say at that. Uh, anybody else? Next person. I have Eric Hutchins. Eric, you're unmuted. Great. Yeah, this is Eric Hutchins, 45 Fools Lane. I got a couple of comments to make. I uh, appreciate your work on this. Um, first with the ADU, um, I think the real, your, your stress for this, which I appreciate, is honing in on empty nesters, elderly, young starter families or local workers. 
I like that premise of this exception um, and in the in this promotion of development under that premise. But if that is the premise for this, I certainly worry that the 30 day will just lead to seasonal rentals and we actually don't get what you want. And you need to seriously think about that. I like what you saying you want, but 30 days will just leave. Seasonals is what boots people out. Is they, they, we all know people that have come here. Oh, I can't find anything for the summer. Then they have to leave and you slowly just kick people out. Kids find something for the winter. Then they can't stay in the summer. Then they move away. Young family, maybe was here for one or two years, bouncing back and forth, but they can't find something permanent. I think there's a real risk that you won't accomplish what you say you're doing. There may be other reasons to not like what I'm saying, but if you're trying to accomplish what you want, I question if it will because of that reason, unfortunately. Could I ask you if you have a suggestion on that, on what's appropriate? Because I, I know that you have a second comment that made that the 30 days is too short. I, I, it's, I, in all honesty, it's, it's got to be longer than a season. Other, otherwise, it'll, you can rent a house out in Rockport for two months and make more than you will in the whole year on a seasonal. So what are you trying to get? If that's your goal, I mean, I can think of other reasons why I may not like it, but if that is your stated goal, um, you, you just won't get it. Just need to be aware of that. I'm, um, I don't, I'm not begging for more development in Rockport, don't get me wrong, but if that's your goal and that's your purpose, I'm not sure you will meet your purpose. Yeah, Eric, um, we hear The other is, yeah, so anyway, and then my other point on this was, because of our sewer and our water limitations in town and infrastructure, I don't think this should be in the SRAA district because we don't want to promote development in our relatively undeveloped areas. Um, and we, we've already done tests, uh, surveys that show we don't have enough, we have just enough sewer capacity right now for development by right within our sewer district. I don't think we want to do anything like this to promote extensions and further development in areas that um, when we already have not enough capacity. So I think that needs to be seriously thought about. The other districts, yes, because they already have sewer and water for the most part, but not to expand it and entice development in areas that don't have our municipal infrastructure set up. Okay, that's all I had on that one. The transit oriented, but I'm trying to be brief. Um, I'm in a butter, for any of you who don't know, I live next to it. Um, I've lived relatively close for 25 years. Now I would, for all practical purposes, have to drive through that district to go anywhere. So I've had a lot of time to think about this. And I got to admit, in the big picture, I'm definitely supportive. Um, I may not like some things about it, but I realize it's the right place. And in many ways, it's the right thing to do. The one thing I would like to see are some standards built in that prevent redevelopment from just saying, oh, we just have to, since we're redevelopment, we don't have to meet environmental standards as much. I would like to know that there's something in here that truly isn't just a, because you see that too often with redevelopment. Oh yeah, our runoff's the same as it used to be. We need improvements because that whole area is one big impervious surface and it's our, one of our biggest impacts to Millbrook, Mill Pond and Front Beach. So if we're gonna let denser development go in there, we need some provision that's not a break even, but a net gain on runoff in particular. Um, one other comment on the transit. Um, in the slideshow, I, I need to correct you on something. I do not believe the transit oriented district will do anything to prevent development at other locations or make better or create open space. They're independent. It, all, they, it won't do anything to slow development down in other locations. Um, that was one of the points in the slide, unfortunately. I just, that's, I don't think that's correct. It doesn't factor in. So just to be clear on that, doesn't, it's not gonna help open space other places. Um, and the other one, um, open space. I worked on the original one. This looks great. It looks much better. I'm definitely supportive. And if you're looking for a map to find out 
opened the large parcels as far as a question came up. The Open Space Committee and the Open Space Plan has all the big lots identified in it. And the Watershed Protection Committee created a map called Parcel Information for all of the undeveloped parcels in the Watershed Overlay District. So it would allow you to see which parcels may be developable that meet your bylaw based on the question that came up earlier. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Up next, I have Toby. Toby, you're unmuted. Thank you, Toby Arsenia, 95 Granite Street. Um, unlike the other speakers, I'm not grateful for your efforts, not delighted. I think two of the proposals, the train station development and the additional units uh, by right uh, would be a disaster for the town and the open space and residential is problematic. Uh, and the details, you know, perhaps not adequately nailed down. Uh, as for the open space and um, residential, uh, a previous edition of the planning board, Eric, I believe, was part of it, put a huge amount of effort into it. Uh, you've dismissed it rather cavalierly. Uh, if it's to be by right, uh, as opposed to uh, by special permit as for subdivisions, that means that you've got to get all of the details nailed down in the zoning. You don't, as with a subdivision, uh, get a second chance. And uh, no member of the present planning board has uh, sat through a subdivision. In fact, there hasn't been one since uh, uh, Lufkin Farm uh, the, uh, off Upper Main Street. And that would be long before any of you joined the board. Uh, a subdivision is a really intensive, arduous process. And if you don't get it all nailed down, uh, there's nothing else you can do about it. Uh, as for the additional units, someone spoke about ownership. Um, it, no one seems to have considered that increasingly uh, when people buy property, it's limited liability corporations. It could be um, trusts. Apparently, South Dakota is a, a fabulous place for incorporating trusts that nobody can follow up on, um, and there are other places. So when you talk about the owner living on the premises, uh, where does the trust live? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, you need some other sort of wording on that, but that's a minor concern. I also noticed that, that there are no proper setbacks, so I don't see how you can reasonably make the case that it's harmless to, uh, to the neighbors. It would be disastrous for the neighbors to have a chicken coop on your boundary where there are often uh, existing buildings uh, that predate zoning or that somehow appeared there to have such a structure turn into a dwelling. Uh, rough luck for you and uh, how nice for the people who are renting it, a gold mine. But there's no way of telling, uh, as was you were just told by Mr. Hutchins who might rent it. And I don't believe there's any way of controlling that either. Uh, if you know of one, um, you should come forth with it. Uh, also, I remember going back about 15 years, uh, a prior chairman of the planning board told the other members they were concerned about the conversion of buildings on the main street into condominiums, that the planning board zoning couldn't touch that 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 was a form of ownership, not land use. Therefore, it's not your bailiwick. So um, what if the people decide they're going to sell uh, the chicken coop apartments, the additional units? Have you run it by town council? Uh, got it signed on paper with a date on it that, in fact, uh, you can control the ownership of those? I would be very skeptical, but I don't know. And as for the train station development, I'm altogether against it. But if you're trying to sell it to the voters, you need to be honest with them about what might possibly happen. Uh, you were told 50 acres. Uh, what you first came up with clearly wasn't 50 acres, but now it's expanded and perhaps it is. That's a question, is it? Um, uh, so with 15 units by right on an acre, uh, you have to deduct, of course, for streets, which are not zoned and not buildable, at least public streets. Uh, private ones, such as uh, Smith's parking lot, are in fact part of a lot, not a street at all. But how many houses 
could uh, minimally and maximally be built in that district. And if you haven't figured that out, I don't think you're in any position to sell it to the voters. Uh, I'm hoping you don't succeed. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I've done a few subdivisions in my 35 years as a lawyer, just a few. But anyway, does uh, anybody, who's next? Next, I have Rich Lohr again. You're unmuted. Hi, I'm uh, Rich Lorigan, 78 Granite Street. And just a short question. I'm not sure, and maybe I should know, what a two and a half story is. That half story, does that mean there are um, less uh, square footage and a separate apartment? Um, and the other question in regards to that is what is the, um, uh, the maximum height um, code? Uh, because there was an article in the paper a couple of days ago about how uh, whatever the height is, it, uh, it could be uh, increased uh, at some point uh, during the process. Thank you. Chris, I, I'm not sure, Mr. Lorigan, are you are you talking about townwide or in the proposed TOVO district? I'm not in, sure. In the proposed district. Okay, in the proposed TOVOD district. So, so in terms of two and a half stories, that that's defined elsewhere in the bylaw. Um, actually, the the planning board put, put forth a proposal to actually clarify what a half story um, actually means and. The essential, I guess, just at a high level, what it means is when you have a, a sloped roof, um, part of that floor um, isn't really habitable because of the slope of the roof, but a portion of it is, and you might have dormers in that roof to, to increase that size of, of what's habitable. Um, but that's, it's essentially when you have a sloped roof, um, that's where you have the half story. Okay, so what's the uh, maximum height now? The, and the height in the overlay district is, proposed to be 38 feet as the maximum. Um, the purpose of that height is it allows you to get a, a pretty nice pitch of the roof. Um, whereas if you have a lower height, you end up having, a, it's, it's, it's very um, kind of shallow type of roof. So this, this just gives you um, a little bit more of a, um, of a pitch. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next up, I have Mr. Orlando. You're unmuted. Hi, this is Paul Orlando, the building inspector. Um, I think all of these items that are being discussed tonight are really good things to have in our bylaw. Um, I just have a couple of questions or issues I'd like to touch on. I assume you can hear me, right? Sure, yes, absolutely. Sir. Okay. Um, one of them is on the accessory dwelling unit. Is there a limit to the number of units that could be on a lot? I see that the definition says that it's a second dwelling unit, so subordinate to the size and principal dwelling. So does that mean it can only be allowed on a property with a single dwelling unit already? And if so, maybe we could just make that more clear. Okay. Um, and the language of the bylaw, it keeps using the word accessory apartment, which is not defined in the bylaw. So maybe instead of accessory apartment, we should just use accessory dwelling yeah. in all those items. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now move on to um, the open space and residential development. Um, I was in a meeting last year with uh, Mark Bobrowski. He's a zoning attorney in the state. I'm sure you might be familiar with him, some of you people. I know who he is. And he indicated that to require a special permit for a subdivision is not legal in the state of Massachusetts. If you meet the requirements of a subdivision, you have to treat it like a subdivision. You can't require them to go for a special permit. 
well, so, well, don't forget, we, we don't require a special permit for a uh, um, open space residential development. That's right, that's right. But this, this, this bylaw is going to require you to get a special permit for a conventional subdivision, which I don't, I'm not sure you could do that. So you might want to run that by town we're, council. We're, yeah, we're not, this, just to let you know, this is not reinventing the wheel here. We, this, this type of law exists in other communities too. You know, we're not, I don't think MAPC just made this up. Is that correct? Chris? That is correct. Ralph, do you, you often have this type of experience? Yeah, uh, Ralph Woman from MAPC. Um, I would just add that um, uh, this type of uh, a bylaw has been adopted by a number of other communities. And in order for that to have happened, it would have had to have been uh, approved by the attorney general's office. So, um, so I assume that this kind of uh, scenario where the OSRD is allowed by right, but a conventional subdivision is allowed by special permit would pass muster. All right. The, the reason I bring that up is because we went through the same process. I, I work as a building inspector in Manchester, and that mm -hmm. planning board hired Mark to be the consultant to do the same thing, to rewrite the zoning bylaws. And he is recommending or requiring that we take it out because it's unlawful. And I just don't want the town of Rockport to produce something that's unlawful um, when it's held up in court. I just want to put it out there. Well, I know, Paul, I, and I appreciate okay. your comment. Um, I, I don't know if, obviously there may be a difference of opinion, but I, I will look into that more. Okay, and the other thing with the open space and residential development is that it allows only the same number of units that you could have with a conventional subdivision. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Um, there are some OSRDs that do allow um, bonuses, density bonuses. Um, we, we didn't include that in this version um, simply because we wanted to kind of keep it as equivalent to the existing subdivision. Um, as an alternative. But, but it, so there's not really an incentive to do this for the applicant if they could just do a conventional subdivision and not go through this whole process. Well, now that that's the that's actually kind of the reason I think the impetus for having the traditional subdivision now you would have to go through a special permit and this version only if that's allowed. Permit. If that if, correct, if that's allowed. Right. If it's not allowed then you're right, there would be much less of an incentive to to do this and the way you would compensate that would be to allow for like an extra home to be built than otherwise would be able yeah. to so all i would ask i think i think this is a great bylaw and it's a great thing to have all i would ask is that we look into whether it's permissible to require a special permit for a conventional subdivision and if not maybe you want to have some kind of incentive to to use this open space bylaw which i think is a really good thing no, that's good. I mean, look, we'll look into it, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And then I just have one last comment on the um, transit development. I attended a um, webinar last week put on by the state. I don't know if anybody else attended that about the requirements for the MBTA compliance. Yep. And, and they did talk about the minimum size of the the district to be 50 acres yeah, and to be so, able to accommodate at least 750 units. Yeah. So that's, that's obviously a, a big issue, not just in a place like Rockport, but every community. Um, and um, I know many communities and MAPC has been um, expressing our concerns about, about that size. These are just drafts, um, okay. dr just drafts. And I think as DHCD hears from communities about that concern, um, my hope certainly is that it will be reduced. Um, I would also just add though, that the requirements do allow for, multi, for this to be sort of multiple districts. And as of last night, what we were talking about in the R district is allowing townhomes up to four units that, that meets that definition of multifamily. And so you could actually between the TOD and if the R district proposed changes pass, that actually I think would you would hit the 50 acres and and meet the requirements, I, I think. That would be ha have to be allowed by right though. Is that correct? 
that is correct. Special permit. Okay. Yeah, that is. I just correct. want to make sure. That, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I think that, I think all these things are great things. I just want to make sure we we're meeting all the requirements, and I think that's excellent. I think it's great work. The, the 50 acres is a draft. This is the thing that the uh, state has thrown out to say, okay, here's our first draft. We want comments on this. How, what does everyone think of this? So the 50 acres is by no means a requirement. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, um, there's gonna be some significant pushback because basically they're, they're treating a town like Salem and a town like Rockport identically. Right. They're not. So exactly. uh, yeah. let's see what happens when uh, it get, we get to you know, the final rule here. But the other thing, and I, I mentioned this to Chris and I think the other planning board members agree, whether or not this is in compliance with the minimal requirements, this, this should be done in the town of Rockport. Oh, I agree. Providing the housing. So there, in other words, the, the state isn't saying it must be 50 acres or else you can't zone for it. No, they're just saying, if you want the benefits from you know, what you get by having this, you must zone for it. But it doesn't, the state is not telling any town that you can't have less than 50 acres. So 50 acres would be a tough sell. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next, I have Laura. Laura, you're unmuted. Unmuted. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm uh, Laura Evans from 77 High Street, and I just wanted to make a comment about the. Uh, the um, length of the rental on the ADUs. I, I, I've lived in town since 1980 and I served two terms on the school board. I know many, many kids who've grown up here and I can almost guarantee you that if you change that 30 days to a normal rental time of 12 months, you know, rented by the year, you would have a, a massive flood of young people and families coming to Rockport to live here and, you know, raise their families here. Uh, right now they can get winter rentals, you know, but they can't afford to buy here. And, you know, if that were somehow attached to the ADUs, what a fabulous boon that would be and to the town and would revitalize us overnight and turn us away from being a retirement community. I wanna thank you for your service and hope you seriously consider what I'm suggesting. So Laura, let me just, clarify what I think you're suggesting is that right now the, the proposed ADU law says that the rental time be no less than 30 days. Are you suggesting that that 30 days should be increased to 12 months? If there was some kind of benefit, you know, I, I don't know how to structure it. You know, I, I just came up with this idea listening to the people's comments, but I, you know, I personally know 10 young people or families who would rent someplace for 12 months and also know that 25 percent of the single family homes in Rockport are owned by people who don't live here and so I, I it was Eric or Toby you know made the point that the ADU may indeed turn out to be a caretaker apartment for you know some place that's vacant except for two weeks a year and there's a lot of young people and families who would, you know, if they could have some place they could rely on for 12 months and rent. Wow, I mean, what a what a really radically different landscape that would be. And I, I don't know, you know, how, how you would structure it or, you know, but it would it would um, draw people to actually live here instead of just visit. Is my point. Okay. If thanks. that's the goal. Yeah. Well, that is the goal. Okay. Well, I, that's how you do it. And if you want names of people who would rent the apartments, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's uh, who's next? Next, I have um, people that have made comments already. Yeah, they've already made comments. Uh, if you have anything more to say, uh, 
please set submit it in writing to the board. You can you can do that by email. Um, make it easy for you, and please submit it within a minimum within the next seven days. You've already made a comment. Anybody else, uh, Kelsey? That's all. Yeah. Yeah, written comments, just to say written comments are very valuable because, um, you know, it's nice to be able to see what you're saying, especially if you're dealing with some more technical issues to see what you're saying in a written form, because we do, we are paying attention to what you're saying, and there have been a lot of good comments made tonight. Uh, we're going to take those to heart, and we're going to, at our next meeting, our regular meeting, which is next Thursday, we're going to be discussing you know, some, some potential changes to the draft that we have now to, uh, to recognize some of those comments. So the faster you can get any additional comments you have in, the better. All right. We have, we have one new person with their hand up. Heath, you're unmuted. Hi, Heath Ritchie, One Woodbury Hill. Uh, are the written comments that are sent into the planning board uh, available on the website for uh, review by other members of the public? Yeah, that's all public record. Sure. How, could you just you know tell me how to find that though? Well, we don't have any yet, <laughs> so there's nothing. So to in the history of the me in the history of the planning board, you've never received a written commentary. No, well, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> You don't have well, I'm not I mean I'm not trying to be a, a smart aleck but like where where would I look for these uh you just need to ask you need to make a freedom of a, a request under the open meetings law for whatever you're looking for to the town clerk and that request comes to the planning board and then we have a deadline to produce the records that you want so if you want to go make requests for any written comments at any other public hearings um you're free to do that and those are those comments are all kept as part of the public record does that answer your question uh i suppose so thanks yeah, that's, that's the way to do it um one other thing i did i did get an email today from uh, jane o'malley uh who says she can listen with to the um public hearing, but she can't comment. And then she proceeds to make quite a few comments uh, in writing on an email. So I'll just go through them quickly because some of them I think I can answer right away. Um, she thanks us for all our efforts. Um, and then the first question is, have, has the town explored all opportunities to reverse the Airbnb short-term rental trend? Um, are there tax incentive incentives in place as tax breaks to encourage year round rentals? That's beyond the purview of, of the planning board. We, we are not regulating uh, or proposing to regulate existing short term rentals that people are doing now. Um, this is only for accessory dwelling units that are seeking a permit, a building permit to construct one uh, then or occupy one. That's that's what we're going to be uh, limiting in terms of short-term rentals. So the answer is what she's asking here is a far bigger issue than what is being addressed in the ADU uh, provision. And frankly, it's really beyond the zoning boards, uh, the, the planning board's ability to to regulate. Um, the next question is, what is the total number of additional dwelling units that could potentially be built if the TOD and ADU bylaws are approved? Uh, I, right off the top of our head, I don't think we can answer that question. Um, how do the, these numbers impact the water and sewer situation in Rockport? All I know is I have discussed this, uh, the TOVD with the DPW um, head and he has said that, yes, um, the, the town is making great strides to eliminate 
infiltration from sewer uh, stormwater into the sewer system and the capacity is there to handle uh, what is being proposed. Again, even if the zoning has changed, it, it may be a long, long time before anything actually is proposed to be built. Um, so it's very hard to project out one year, two years, three years in terms of sewer capacity. Uh, and then how much more traffic can Rockport is expect in January and July? Again, that, that can't be answered at this point. Um, is Rockport coordinating with Gloucester on the potential for dramatically increased traffic? No, uh, we're not. And I don't know what she means by dramatically increased traffic on Eastern Avenue, because again, we don't, there's nothing proposed. All this is, is a creation of an overlay district. It's not, no one's building anything at this point. So it, it's almost impossible to measure what, if any, increased traffic would result. Um, will there be rent control for the new, newly built ADU units? The answer to that is no. Um, and then she talks about affordable housing requirements. Uh, it, this just gets, um, gets very involved, this, this question. Um, and um, I really don't know if I can answer it with the time allotted that we have uh, for any individual in a public hearing. She's saying Rockport does not need any more market rate units. So she's advocating for uh, some kind of a rent regulation, um, which is really not where, what we're talking about here. And um, Again, it says it suggests that the existing senior housing at Millbrook Park could be redeveloped to allow for market rate housing. Why, when we desperately need more affordable housing for seniors and the disabled? The uh, housing units in Millbrook Park are owned by the, um, I believe they're owned by the Rockport Housing Authority. They are not within the TOVO district and they, they were excluded for that reason because they're not gonna be redeveloped. Um, and then the, the rest of her request is kind of on a personal nature. Um, it's her email is gonna be available to anybody to look at just as anybody else's email. It'll be part of our file and part of the comments that all of the planning board members read um, in connection with their work here. So that's all I have. No more other questions or, uh, or people who want to make comment, then uh, we're, I'm going to ask for a motion to close the public hearing, subject to the submission of written comments, which we will gladly accept, um, certainly within the next seven days, get them in so we can consider them at our next meeting. Motion to close the public hearing, subject to the submission of written comments. So moved. Uh, moved by Peter. Second. Seconded by Denise. Um, roll call vote. Denise. Aye. Aye. Peter. Aye. Tom. Aye. And I'll vote in favor. Motion carried. The public hearing is now closed. Um, and if nobody has any further business, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion to adjourn by Denise. Seconded. Second. Seconded by Peter. Roll call vote. Denise. Aye. Peter. Aye. Tom. Aye. Um, I'll vote in favor. The meeting, this public hearing and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everyone who came out with your comments here and everyone stays over the weekend and um, you'll be hearing more from us, believe me. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Stay warm. And also, uh, Kelsey. Thank you.